Welcome to this continuing discussion on Isaiah in our roundtable series of the scriptures. I'm Victor L. Ludlow of the Ancient Scripture Department at BYU, and with me are three colleagues from the campus here. Across the table from me is Jeff Chadwick from the Church History Department. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. And to his right is Richard Draper, one of our colleagues who is a great specialist in the New Testament. Richard, we're glad to have you with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. And Paul Hoskison, who knows more languages than most of us could probably even name, uh, is also from our faculty here. We're glad to have you with us, Paul. Thank you. I just knew, wish I knew English. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're doing just fine. Our discussion uh, in this particular segment deals with chapters 54 and 55 of Isaiah. 54 finishes the major block of Isaiah chapters quoted in the Book of Mormon, although the first couple of verses of chapter 55 are also found uh, in, in Second Nephi. Uh, as we move into chapter 54, this is one of the chapters specifically cited by the resurrected Savior as found in Third Nephi. Uh, why do we think it's so important to have these Isaiah chapters as cited by the Savior in the Book of Mormon. Any ideas here? Jeff, help us out. Well, you know, as we look at Isaiah 54, clearly what the Lord seems to be doing here, and we'll look at this thematically in just a moment, is kind of wrap up and give a grand summary statement about His plan for the house of Israel not just the scattering of Israel, but the gathering of Israel and how all mankind, all the world is blessed by it. And of course, when the Savior visited the Nephites as a resurrected Lord, He quoted two full chapters of Isaiah for them. He quoted Isaiah 50, um, uh, 52 over here in 3 Nephi 20, and He, he quoted uh, chapter 54 in 3 Nephi 22. Both of those seem to speak so much about how this servant Israel has been destined to bless all the earth. It's interesting that the Savior doesn't himself quote Isaiah 53, mm -hmm. which speaks so much of his atoning uh, um, uh, assignment, but he wants to let, and when he's quoting this to the Nephites, obviously, he wants them to know that they're a part of this great plan to spread Israel's blessings throughout the earth. Right, in fact, these uh, this sermon, it's really the third and last major public sermon he gives where these two chapters are quoted. It's the second day of his resurrection ministry. The multitude has increased greatly. It starts, the, the, the teaching is starting in chapter 20 of 3 Nephi, verse 10, uh, spills over a little bit into chapter 23 of 3 Nephi, where within, well, I'll call it roughly three chapters of 3 Nephi, we have two full chapters of Isaiah as you said, 52 and 54 that are merged there. He's talking to covenant people. He talks about covenant people. Particularly about what will happen in the latter days and as a result of that Particularly covenant people in the last days, more than that audience he has. And as you mentioned, the capstone, the, the, the great promise is this chapter 54. And it's interesting that after finishing with 54, the Savior in the Book of Mormon goes on to say this. If you look in, in the subsequent chapter of 3 Nephi, which is chapter 23, it says, he says to the Nephite, and then, and then of course by, by extension to us, 3 Nephi 23, 1, Behold, I say unto you, you ought to search these things. Yea, a commandment I give unto you, that ye search these things diligently, for great are the words of Isaiah. For surely he spake as touching all things concerning my people, which are of the house of Israel. Therefore it must needs be that he must speak also to the Gentiles. In other words, it's a commandment for us to study and understand these things, and maybe even particularly this chapter right here, chapter 54. Okay, now he sets it up here at, at the end of chapter 21 of 3rd Nephi. You've talked about how he summarizes afterwards. He sets it up here in, in, in chapter 21 talking primarily about the gathering of Israel and how that is one of the great signs of the fulfillment of the covenant, that Israel will come gathered back to the lands of their inheritance. And then, verse 1 of chapter 22 of 3 Nephi, shall that which is written come to pass, and he starts quoting this chapter. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. In other words, he's speaking to Israel now, 
there was a long time when Israel bore him no fruit, but now in the latter gathered days, Israel is to sing again because it's going to have a lot of fruit. In fact, the end of verse 1, chapter 54, more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord, meaning lost Israel shall reap more gathered Israel than ever before in ancient times. And I think it's important to realize here too the, the way that Isaiah is expressing this in these verses. If we, if, if we're really blessed by having the commentary and the and the context in in Third Nephi of these verse, of these chapters of Isaiah, I, I think you can if you look carefully you can see the same thing in Isaiah too though. That is, we we talked last time about chapters 52 and 53, the the Messiah motif and the suffering Messiah and how he will make atonement and and so on and so forth. And the result of all of that is that is 54. That is, in the latter days, Zion can now be redeemed. And, and that's why the Savior quotes it there. In, and it's in, joyful in, uh, with singing. And Absolutely, yes. And, and the fruitfulness of Zion in the latter days will be more than ever before. And the metaphor is that husband-wife relationship, the Lord to Israel, the Lord to his church that you yes. mentioned in our previous session. <clears throat> and it was, of course, the wife's job it was the woman's job of, of a family, particularly in the desert wandering situation, to manage the house or the tent if you were in the wilderness, as we often characterize lost Israel as being. So that in the, in the gathering and in the triumph of Israel, which is latter day, the wife is told in verse 2, Israel is told, enlarge the place of thy tent. In other words, you're going to need a bigger yard. You're going to need a bigger house. You're going to have to add on. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitations. In other words, the woman's portion of that tent, which was always the biggest in, in, in the Near East, because it had the women and the children. Because of the women and the children. children. Yep. Lengthen thy cords, strengthen thy stakes. In order to build a bigger tent, you have to have longer tent cords and stronger stakes fastened into the ground to hold that bigger tent that gathered Israel will need. And, and this is no a, doubt where our term today, stakes, comes stakes from. It's from Zion. this passage, the stakes of Zion. Right. That's what we're about. We're spreading a, those a stakes. Tent, making a bigger tent, bringing yes. in more children. Into, into the household. Yeah, this is the first big tent philosophy right here. It's in the <laughs> gathering of Israel. Yes. I'd, I'd like to point out one other item here. The, the, there's no doubt that the focus is on Israel and the, and the glory that's going to come to Israel. But there is also an inclusiveness in these chapters that we see at the end of verse 5 where it says, the God of the whole earth shall he be called uh, the, the Lord has no limit now in the last days, uh, though he is Anyone's Israel's God. Anyone's welcome to come into the it, tent. Bingo, it's exactly right. Very inclusive. We're, we're bringing all that we can uh, into and, the tent. And the reason for that is, it, it kind of alluded to in verse 3, Thou shalt break forth on the right hand, the Lord says to Israel, mm -hmm. and on the left thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, meaning the Gentiles become part of Israel. That was the whole reason for lost Israel assimilating and spreading through the families of the earth. Which is why I think the Savior said, after having quoted this chapter of the Nephites, he said in 3 Nephi 23, that Isaiah speaks about all things concerning the house of Israel, wherefore he must needs speak concerning the Gentiles. Because you can't talk about Latter-day Israel without saying that Latter-day Israel is among the Gentiles. And in fact, the Gentiles are Israel, except they don't know it yet. Because there are scattered remnants of Israel among the Gentiles who have taken up the culture, the language, the appearance. I mean, to look at them, you would think and they would think they're really not House of Israel Semitic. They're, they're more kind of Gentilish in yeah, and, and they don't recognize that until they start to come forth and, 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 and understand this lineage and this potential they have as scattered remnants of Israel among the Gentiles. And it's only, it's only these, it's only when these lost Israelite Gentiles throughout the earth come to the gospel, join the church, accept the restored everlasting covenant of Israel, that they actually reactivate that ancient heritage that they've inherited. Yeah, that, that reminds me of some of the petitions of Joseph Smith in section 109 of the Doctrine and Covenants. This, of course, is the great dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple where he talks about now that the temple is here, remember, Judah, remember these remnants of Israel that are scattered among the Gentiles. Now he realizes we've got a means of, of bringing them into the fold, but not only as far as a church here on earth, but as far as a kingdom 
in the eternities because that's a temple will be here to to provide these blessings to Israel. And, and it was a week later that, that the keys were brought that, to, that's to, right. to, to, to already begin to fulfill this petitioning that was in that dedicatory and prayer. And it's, it's interesting, those keys were not only keys to turn the hearts of the children of the fathers, but they were keys to gather Israel from the four corners of the earth. It's interesting that we use those keys not only in our temples, but in our missions. That's right. We gather Israel through our missionary work, the hunters and fishers of men. And, and that's why that previous chapter, 52-7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who saith to Zion, thy God reigneth. That's it. That's the gathering of Israel. Our proselyting, taking of the covenant to the Gentiles gathers Israel. Mm -hmm. and this, this gathering in the latter days, <clears throat> Isaiah is very clear about it. It's going to only happen after there is an apostasy. Mm -hmm. And that's what he mentions here in, in this middle part of chapter 54, like in verse 6. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken. Israel has. His wife has been. She's walked out on him. It's as if she has been forsaken and grieved in spirit. And a wife of youth. Israel was the wife of his youth back in the Old Testament days. When thou wast refused, saith the Lord, for a small moment have I forsaken me, but with great mercies will I gather thee. After that long period of apostasy, he will gather her in again. And, and eternally that long period of apostasy is it's as very if it short. were a moment. Yes. Yeah. And, and I like this one too, picking up with the, the imagery of verse 9 and 10. It's very, very mm -hmm. powerful. Uh, for this is as the waters of Noah unto me, and then the explanation, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I would not be wroth with thee nor rebuke thee, for the mountains shall depart, the hills removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed. I mean, you talk about a, an unconditional promise there for those in the last days who have finally learned a lesson, who are fully devoted, devoted to the Lord, who are living his laws, and, and, and now we get the blessing cemented upon the people. And then in, starting in verse 11, he uses some imagery we find in some other Old Testament prophets where Zion, or the city of Zion, Jerusalem, is described with all of these different kinds of stones and, 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 and uh, imagery of, of, of jewels and, and, and so forth. Uh, what, what, what is this supposed to represent? How do we, what, what is Isaiah trying to tell us here? It's obviously talking about the glory of, of the restoration in the latter days. The, and, and even into the, the millennium, because yes, Isaiah yes. very seldom differentiates between the last days and, and, and the continuation of the last yes. days, which is the millennial glory. And, and along with that, near the end of chapter 54, uh, where he says, Behold, I have created the smith that uh, bloweth uh, the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. Uh, he's really saying, I am in charge. Zion is going to be gathered. It's going to be beautiful and glorious. And then to sum it all up, there's nothing that can stop the work in these latter days. I created the smith. I know what's going on. And therefore, no weapon that is formed against thee, in verse 17, shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in the judgment thou shalt condemn. There is no stopping this work in the latter days. You know, so Paul, it's, it's only, interesting, if I could yeah. just point in there about verse 17, that, that uh, it's not footnoted in my Bible, but uh, Doctrine and Covenants 71.9, the Lord quotes that very phrase to Joseph Smith in the church, no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. 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 So, we, so we have the Lord here not only bringing forth the smith, the builder, the, the servants, the, the missionaries out from the tops of the mountains, that blessed be the feet of them, and so forth, but he's also even allowed and, and provided for those that would destroy the wicked and, and so forth. Uh, so it's all part of, of, of his plan. Before you advance from this, I want to point out one important aspect of this, and that is real revelation from God to the children, to his children on earth is, is an aspect of this time. Verse 13, all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. That's what latter-day gathered Israel, the church is about, ongoing revelation. And you know, there's an interesting cross-reference of Isaiah 54, 13 to the New Testament that we don't often see. And since we ought to note those, it's John 6, 45. In that great bread of life sermon where Jesus at Capernaum in the synagogue is now turning his ministry to convincing his followers that he is not merely Messiah, but also deity, 
He says um, in John 6, 45, it is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. And the only scripture in all the Old Testament prophets that, that seems to be that one is this one right here, Isaiah 54, 13. All thy children shall be taught of the Lord. It was Jesus' way of saying I'm he was Lord God. I'm yeah. and, and I think they would have recognized it from Isaiah 54, even though sometimes it slips us in our teaching in the New Testament. Thank you. Now, we need to move on to chapter 55 here. Uh, the first couple of verses are an invitation, uh, one that I think would, would maybe like to see advertised on television to come and buy and eat without money. This is the invitation like to the banquet of the latter days, the banquet the big, of the restoration. The grand fest, feast yes. of, of the Lord. Uh, I, I did note, though, as I uh, saw how Jacob uh, used these first couple of verses in Second Nephi chapter 9 uh, in verses 15 and 51. The way it's punctuated, of course there was no punctuation in ancient Hebrew, but the way the King James scholars have it punctuated here in verse 2, it's, it's an interrogative. Wherefore do you spend money for what is not bread? Your labor, it's a question. Mm -hmm. But in Jacob turns Jacob, it around, he doesn't turn, he? He makes it a statement yeah. rather than a question. Uh, Creative use of scripture by a prophet. <laughs> it's a prophet's prerogative. Yes. Uh, let, let me just point this, since we're on uh, these verses right here, that there, that there is a, a tension that uh, is important to recognize and also to resolve, and that is the people have been invited to come and eat, but without money or without price. Uh, how do you buy if you don't have any money? Well, why would they even charge? If there, is, uh, if there is no price. And of course the answer is that there was a price, but it has already been paid, and therefore these people can come even if they have no money. It, 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 that's not a requirement anymore. And, and this is amplified actually. Uh, we don't know whether this is J Jacob's uh, amplification or if this is an, an expanded version of the text, but uh, verse 2 towards the end here, we have this invitation to heart diligently unto me and eat ye that which is good and let your soul delight in fatness. In place of the and eat ye that which is good, there's, it's expanded greatly here. Let me read from 2 Nephi chapter 9 verse 51. Hearken diligently unto me and remember the words which I have spoken and come unto the Holy One of Israel and feast upon that which perisheth not, neither can be corrupted, and let your soul delight in fatness. I mean, this is a beautiful expanded invitation here to remember, come to the Holy One of Israel, feast. And, and how do you do that is the question. How do you come to the Holy One of Israel and feast? What is the metaphor involved? The Lord always tells us. And it's mm -hmm. interesting that in verse 3 of Isaiah 55, he, Tells us how it is you come to eat. You incline your ear and come to me and hear, and your soul shall live. We will listen to the gospel when it's preached to us. And then, having heard it, verse 3, third line, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even the sure mercies of David, those sure mercies which are uh, referred to in Acts 13, 34, the, the the, the promises and the blessings that Christ gives to those. Particularly who resurrection and re redemption that, uh, that Paul talks about that, there. That, yes. that, which, that which baptism symbolizes, both the cleanliness of, of the, the atonement provides us and the resurrection which his resurrection provides us. Now, I know there are times in all of our lives where we may feel a little distant and even though the Lord is inviting us to come to him, we feel like our lives, our behavior, whatever might separate us. But it's interesting, uh, one of my favorite passages in this uh, chapter is verse 6, where Isaiah invites us to seek the Lord while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. Now granted, he sometimes seems to be far distant from us, but if we will turn and come nearer to him, then he, will, he won't be so far away. But if we don't heed this invitation, we just naturally tend to drift further and further away, and we'll look back to where we are now and say, oh, I wish I was as close to the Lord as I was back then if we don't constantly work to draw nearer to him. And I think that leads into verse 8 because uh, one of the ways to read verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, that is, uh, we may think that, that God is distant from us, 
but that's not what God is thinking. Right. Uh, he wants us back. And, and, and uh, he feels still close to us, even <laughs> if we don't feel close to him. Right. And in verse 7, right before verse 8, he elaborates how much he is willing to forgive in order to have us back. Yes. Verse 7, I think you could make a sermon around verse 7 itself. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he'll have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly Pardon. This is not the usual image we get of the God of the Old Testament, is it? Well, that's because the usual <laughs> image that's out there in the literature about the God of the Old Testament is not often really reflecting what's in here. Yeah, it's not what's in the text. It's mercy and pardoning and forgiveness and a loving invitation. But Isaiah surely emphasizes it here. In these you know, it's interesting, <laughs> just to go back for a second, I think one of the, the things that the Lord may be saying in verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts, it is that our thoughts seem to be, there's no way I can be forgiven. There's no way the Lord mm -hmm. can really do those wonderful things for me. It, it, our thoughts are always doubtful. His thoughts are always, I can do this. I have done this. Just come. That's right. Just, yeah, come. just come. Richard, you were going to say something. Well, just flow, flowing out of this, again, it's verse 10, uh, that, the, the meaning of that four. You know, my, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, my way than your way. It, it, it reminds me a little bit of Joseph's misstatement where he says, our, our meetings have been really too mundane. Mm -hmm. they, they don't come up to the expectations God has of us. And I think of this verse of Isaiah when I hear Joseph <laughs> saying that. And, yeah. so, and that leads into verse 10. Go ahead. Yeah, well, what I'm seeing him doing, for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bright forth to bud, uh, bright, uh, excuse me, bring forth and bud, that it may have seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth. The, the idea of the, the quiet, you know, the, the snowfall, the rainfall, the, uh, the snows lay in the mountains and, it, and then they come down. So is the power and the inspiration. Here in this, these last days, the Lord is working quietly and softly and gently, but bringing life. But you know, there's a cycle here that he talks about. Mm -hmm. uh, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, his ways are above sure. our ways. Now he's sending three things from the heavens down there to earth, their purposes to fulfill. Verse 10 are the, are the waters, the moisture that is necessary for physical life. Verse 11 is the word, that which is necessary for spiritual life. And then finally, verse 12, you will go forth. He sends us forth here. For, for multiple purposes. I mean, if you think all of the values and uses of water, you think of all the richness and value and blessings that we receive through the Word of God, uh, through ancient scriptures and modern prophets and through the Spirit. But then now we're here, multiple purposes to fulfill, but it's to be a cycle. The moisture returns back to the heavens. The Word returns back to the heavens. Ultimately, we are to return back to the heavens. Our purpose is fulfilled. If we do that, verse 13, then instead of, say, thorns and briars like this telestial world, you have furs and myrtles and, and, and wonderful. I mean, he's saying instead of a telestial world, we'll have a celestial kingdom, and you will be an everlasting sign, a, a, an eternal monument. I mean, we become a resurrected, immortal, celestial symbol, a sign, a monument that says, Heavenly Father's plan worked. We had to follow His ways, not our ways, or one of our brother's ways to get back into Heavenly Father's presence. His ways were the way that brought us back. Yeah. It's interesting you point out about that rain coming down as if it were not only the physical rain, but the blessed word of the Lord, because that's exactly what he says in the Doctrine and Covenants, and he uses the very rain and moisture imagery of, of the land of Israel as the dews of Carmel. That's so right. shall the word of the Lord distill upon his people. Richard, go ahead. Well, I was just, I was just thinking, just uh, kind of drawing things together right here. Chapter 53, we have the suffering servant and uh, all that he does. Then beginning in chapter 54, we have the outgrowth. What does that suffering bring about? And just to pick up some, some verses, uh, it says in verse 4, halfway through, thou shalt not, uh, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth. That's one of the outgrowths. The, the, uh, for the shame maker, of our sins. Yeah, the shame of our sins. sins yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for thy maker is thy husband, the reuniting of the covenant that's going on. 
Verse 7, but with great mercies will I gather thee. So that's going to come out of the atonement. As for the waters of Noah, the covenant's reestablished. It will not be broken in this last days. Verse 14, in righteousness shalt thou be established. So the establishment. And then verse 17, which I think carries a real message uh, for us. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shall be condemned. I'm impressed that there is no immunity for Latter-day Israel in being attacked. You'll notice that they are being attacked, but no attack will prevail. And the reason is because the truth is with Israel. The word of God is with Israel and therefore it will move for that is say Israel move, will f move forward in victory unto the end. And the way we do it is to come in line with him, his ways, his thoughts, which are not the ways we would ordinarily be inclined to do it. But then as we come unto him, return unto him, there's just so many ways that Isaiah expresses this. We have this opportunity to return back and be justified through his justice and mercy. Isaiah seems to have understood the plan. I guess the question is, how well do we understand it and, <laughs> well, and live it? Well, Let's search well it diligently. <laughs> yes, good. amen. Thank you for your insights to help us to try to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.